axle in the old wooden ox cart had only one job to do. In this type of vehicle, the power was supplied from an outside force. The cart was either pulled or pushed while the axle was stationary and had nothing to do but support the load. Well, hello again, everybody. So we're looking at the back axle now, and this axle's a bit different than some of the other trucks. As I said earlier, this truck is called the 3600 model, which means it's three quarter ton. The more popular model is the 3100, which is a lighter weight truck. Now, because this is a heavier truck, it's got a different axle arrangement. It's got it's a little less common, and what they call it is a it's a fully floating back axle. The axle arrangement is more like what you would find on a real truck. With this construction. Axle shaft breakage is extremely remote. But should it ever happen, the Chevrolet full floating rear axle permits easy removal and replacement of either axle shafts without taking off the wheel or removing the load. But one of the problems that I've had with this, and I think I showed it on one of the, uh, the previous videos, is that um, I came out one day when I had it jacked up and I found a huge puddle of oil under the car and all the, uh, the gear oil had run out from the differential, it had run down the, uh, the axle tube and uh, it obviously leaked past the, the, uh, the oil seals and run into the drums and there was just a big puddle of oil under the car which was massively annoying seeing as I'd put new, uh, <laughs> new brake shoes on at some point not that long ago. One of the things that I think is interesting on this truck is that you can see we've got what looks like two sets of leaf springs. Of course a lot of vehicles would have this set of leaf springs here but you can see that we've got what looks like a completely separate set on top of it and uh, it's a little bit strange because you know the, the main leaf spring, this lower one, it's attached at this end and it's also attached at the other end down there but this leaf spring appears to be floating. Well what this is for is when the vehicle's unloaded it will be running on this spring here. This is the one that's you know doing all the suspension work but when you uh, actually fill the vehicle up with you know three three quarter tons of uh, tools or equipment in the back the uh, these springs will the, well the body will compress and it will come to rest on top of this second set of leaf springs here. So I think the idea behind that is so you've got some progressive suspension. If you actually had all these leaf springs permanently attached all the time, the um, the vehicle would be too hard, um, the suspension would be absolutely solid. So it normally runs on this lighter set of springs here, but when it's got enough weight on it, this set, second set of springs in uh, starts doing the work. So it, yeah, it's it's progressive suspension. I'm not sure exactly what the name for that arrangement is, but uh, it's actually, I think it's fairly common on trucks and things like that, but a little bit unusual. Probably would have helped if I'd read the instructions for doing this, wouldn't it? Okay, so you see I could pull this forward a bit then. It pulled forward and then it stopped. And the reason it's stopping is because it's getting caught on the brake shoes. I don't know if you can actually see there's a... You can see the oil on here. As I say, all this has run out from the... Uh, it's all running from the uh, differential unit. At first, I was—I don't know if I was hoping. I thought it might have been—I um, thought it might have been brake fluid, but it has a distinctive um, smell. Gear oil—it kind of smells. Um, um, what does it smell like? It smells sulphury. It smells a bit farty um, because it does actually usually have a sulphur con content in it. I think it's an anti-foaming agent, um, so you can t you can tell the smell of. Uh, of gear oil and it tends to be a little bit sticky you can you can you can feel it whereas a uh, brake fluid is very thin and um, well I guess brake fluid has a distinctive odor of its own I don't know what you describe the smell of brake brake fluid as I'd say it's more a chemically smell it smells more like a chemical I know I know everything's chemicals but I don't know brake fluid smells more like a, a chemical smell an unnatural smell Whereas oil just smells, you know, a bit oily. 
So uh, yeah, you can tell the difference. Let's just put them up there so I can knock them off onto myself later. Well, it just came off. I wasn't expecting that. I thought it would have at least uh, fought me a little bit. That's quite good, actually, because I wanted to have another go at getting my head the way that these brake adjusters work. There is a, an adjustment underneath here where my hand is, and there's a little slot in the back in, back in plate, and you've got to put a tool in there. And uh, Well, I'll show you how you do it at some point, but it, you've got to go the right way. If you go the wrong way, you end up putting the brakes on even further, which is, uh, yeah, it's not good. I do actually think the braking arrangement on these things, I actually think, is horrendously complicated. Um, maybe that's me just being a little bit of a girl, but um, yeah, certainly um, back in the uh, 1950s when this built, was built, you can see that brakes were still very much under development. And if you look at modern, even modern drummed brakes, there's, there's many less moving parts than there is in this. I mean, it's not just a couple, there's a couple of springs there, but there's some springs down there. There's a pad retaining springs which go under here. I think there's another set of springs lower down. Basically there's springs everywhere and they're all just waiting to jump off and bugger off to some accessible corner in the garage. Oh, so I'll just hold the drum up there and you can see that you can see where the oil has run down and uh, yeah I mean it's it's thick with oil. You can see it, the puddles of oil. So all that oil as well as being on the inside of the drum it's actually just lavering into the uh, the brake shoes. So we're also going to have to replace the brake shoes but I'm not going to do that uh, today and the reason I'm not going to do it is because I want to make sure that the fix of actually uh, changing the um, of, ch of changing these oil seals works. I'm not going to put new oil seals in uh, and then do the brakes at the same time because if I've got it wrong or if it's still leaking um, I'm just going to contaminate yet another set of pads and that, that I don't want to do that. So what we'll do is we'll just clean off the oil using brake cleaner and we'll just do it as well as we can. Now I'm just looking at something what I think is a little bit suspect on here. I can see there's like a, a little bit of lipping on the pad. Um, it's got like a little bit of a corner out of it. Um, you probably can't see it but I can. Well you can see that the edge of the brake shoe here has got kind of like a bit of a lip on it. It's got like a it's like a, going down a stair, it's got a step in it right at the edge. And that's that's a little bit odd. You shouldn't really get that. It should be the same should be the same all the way across. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to go uh, you know, a little bit quincy on these things and find out what's going on. So hopefully you can see that there's this step inside there which uh, you know, kind of really shouldn't be there. So it's been skimmed up this drum. Now it is a normal activity to skim these drums up but I don't actually think you can generally skim that much off them. And it looks like quite a lot of meat's been removed off this one. The actual wall looks kind of thinner than I would have expected. I'm not going to worry about that too much because let's face it, I'm only going to be poodling around at 30-40 miles an hour. I'm not going to be doing a lot of mileage and it's never going to have uh, three quarters of tons of steel in the back of it. So I'm not too concerned. I think we'll be able to get the brakes uh, into a reasonable enough condition to make it um, safe to drive. Um, but they're never going to be on a par with a, with a modern vehicle. Um, especially because they haven't got servos and they're only a single circuit braking system which makes it always exciting. So basically if one of these rubber pipes, you know, if one of these pipes from the master cylinder ruptures, you basically, your brake pedal just goes to the floor and you just lose your entire braking system because it's only a single circuit as opposed to a dual circuit system. But uh, yeah, it wants to live forever, eh? An engineer told me before he died, a rum titty bum titty bum titty bum, he knew of a bum of a Okay, so uh, that'll do for a quick clean. I'm going to clean these again before we put it back on, but that's not the worst of the crud off it, I think. Got rid of most of the oil. I think it probably wants to go around this with a wire brush, I think, inside, because uh, there's a couple of spots that I don't like the look of. There might still be some more oil and contamination hiding inside here. Now, I can definitely tell just by running my finger along here that these these drums have been skimmed up and I'm guessing fairly recently because normally you would have a little bit of a valley where the actual brake shoes press, they actually wear 
they wear a groove into the drum and that's why I was expecting to have to fight to get this drum off because normally the brake shoes come out and they get trapped within the valley, they get trapped in the groove and as you're trying to pull the, uh, the drum off what happens is the brake shoes hold the drum on but that didn't happen, it just came off and the reason it just came off so easily is because there is no wear at all in these. So these have been skimmed up fairly recently, I think. And uh, again, the very bright metal there, like shiny bright metal. And the fact that I can feel a couple of tool marks here looks as though maybe these have been skimmed up more than once in the past. I can actually see three sets of lines here and they all look slightly different. So maybe these have been skimmed up three times. So the next job is to take the half shaft off and uh, I kind of think I might have made a bit of a mistake taking that drum off first. We might end up putting it back on and then putting the parking brake on because I suspect that this all this is going to turn when I try and undo these big bolts here which to take the half shafts off. But uh, maybe I can jam a piece of wood or a bar in there. Uh, but before I do any of that, I'll just clean these up a bit. I like to make it easy as I can do to put spanners on. There's no point in fighting dirt and corrosion when you're trying to undo fasteners. Now I'm not sure how easily they will come off. Um, hopefully when we undo these bolts and give it a tap, they'll just come out the half shafts. But what we might have to do is what they call draw them out. There's actually some, um, I believe, they, they, they're covered up with rust and dirt at the moment. I think there's some tapped holes here that we can put um, bolts into them, use them as jacking screws to jack the half shafts out. But again, we'll uh, we'll see if they come out first. <laughs> God, God, I must be unfit if using a wire brush is tiring me out. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, definitely should have done this while the truck was on the ground, shouldn't I? That would have been the, uh, that'd have been the correct way. I think we need to get ready to release the smoo, perhaps, because we can see that there is a there is these are wet with uh, with yeah, oh god, it really rotten egg smell. Yeah, if you smell these, it is a really horrible rotten egg smell. I think that's going to come out actually. God, now this is one heavy shaft. I used to think the ones on Land Rovers were heavy, but this thing weighs an absolute ton. It's really heavy. Maybe it's just me that's getting old and feeble. I have to put that down. <laughs> So I've just brought you in now to look at the uh, the end of the axle. So what we've got here is this this round section here. This is this is the end of the axle, and the end of this axle is is threaded. It's got a fine screw thread on it, and then this thing here that we're looking at is a is a nut. And you can see I can turn it a little bit, but I can't turn it very far. And the reason I can't turn it very far is you see that this nut has got well, well I've got a, a scriber poked in at the moment. It's got these little notches in it. It's like, a, it's like a castle nut and uh, these little notches, we have these little tabs of metal and these little tabs, it's called a tab washer, are bent in. Well it's bent in there, one of these tabs lines up with this nut and it's, it's bent in there and that's what's stopping me from rotating these nuts to get it off. So what we've got to do is we've got to just get a tool in there and uh, I probably can't do it on camera, I'm going to have to bend this back out, bend the tab away and then we can just put a tool in here and spin this nut off. Well, that's a theory anyway. So I've just knocked this tab out of the notch, so hopefully this should just come off now. So 
So there's the, uh, there's the actual lock nut with its fine thread. Here's the tab washer. If you just need to scoot out. And then there's another nut inside here that I'm just pushing around with this uh, screwdriver. Hopefully that should come out easily. Just seems to tighten up at the end here, so I suspect one of the threads might be a bit damaged. They're fine threads, and I suspect it's it's quite easy to damage them. To use that tool again. So there's even nut. And I think that's the bearing we're looking at now. So in theory I think this hub should come off. I've not bear in mind I've not done this before, so I could be wrong. Well, although you got some television magic there, I did actually have a bit of trouble pulling this off. Um, it didn't come off as easily as I would have hoped. And I think the reason it didn't come off is you can just see here that the, uh, I don't know what you'd call this, uh, it looks as though this hub has got some kind of a little shell round it, a piece of metal, which I think is probably some kind of a flinger to help get rid of any oil that leaks out. And. Uh, yeah, it's just bent there, so I think that this was uh, this was catching on something. So although I was pulling and pulling and pulling, it really didn't want to come off. Um, so I'm not sure what to say about that. We'll have to we'll have to bend it out again, won't we? Try and straighten it up. Looks as though this piece of uh, tin, this thin piece of tin here, looks as though you can't get it off easily because uh, I think the uh, the studs these are these are what the wheels mount on, the wheel studs looks as though these are uh, pressed through here and uh, are also retaining this piece of tin so I don't think we'll be able to get these out very easily um, so we'll just have to get a pair of pliers and bend it out I don't think I want to change these bearings right now although I suspect they could probably do with it at some point um, in a perfect world I would change them and just do them now but uh, yeah it's not a perfect world is it so what I think I might do is I might just uh, have a look at what the there's a number on these um, and I think what I might try and do is I'll just write this number down and uh, rather than buying the bearings from Chevy which will be expensive what I think I'll try and do is see if I can uh, just source some from a local bearing supplier as I say there is a number and they've got I can see in there it says <coughs> made in the US of A which is always good made in the US of A and then there's a number there which looks like OE9118. And then it says uh, Hayati. Then there's another number. I don't know. Looks like it could be 26-B. Not sure. So I'm going to write all that down because at some point that might be, uh, might be useful to do that. Now underneath all this crud that you can see here there's actually an oil seal hiding underneath here and that's what that's what we're trying to replace. So I'm going to have to pull that oil seal out but I think if I can try to protect this bearing from any crud that's going to drop in there I think that might not be a bad idea to start with because I think it's all going to get a bit dirty. Yeah, God, there's a lot of crud and old filth in here. Anyway, we'll try and give that a bit of a clean up. Ugh, what a horrible sticky mess.
think she's going. Oh, okay, so there's the uh, there's the bearing out. Okay, what I think I'm going to do now is uh, we've got a few um, various tap tools and things in here. So we've got some tap tools in here that was holding the half shafts in, and we've also got the, uh, the drilled and taps holes here that um, we're holding the brake drums on. So while it's off, I'm going to run some taps through here. And then I'm going to clean it all off properly and blow it out with an airline so that there's no swarf or bits remaining in here. When we've done that, we can look at reassembling. Yeah, there is a there's a lot of years of crud. So we'll just clean all these screw threads up a little bit. I don't actually think I'm taking any metal out here. I think literally it is just bits of old sealant that I'm removing. Um, I am a little bit concerned that these are through holes and anything that I take off here is going to drop into the bearings, which isn't a good idea, but I'm going to try and give them a really good clean, as clean, you know, get them as clean as I can once I've done this. So I'm not too worried. I think I've just figured out what these pieces of tin is for with these, uh, you know, odd shapes. I don't know what you call them, these ribs on it. Yeah, rib for her pleasure. Um, I think I've just figured out what they're for. If you look on the other side of this, where these uh, where these ribs are, if you look at it, there's some there's some holes here, and these holes are kind of totally blocked up with dirt and crud. But what I reckon those are for is that any oil, any oil that leaks past the uh, seal here it will fall against a flinger and then what the flinger will do is it will actually direct it into this piece of tin and it will run down and the idea is it, it should come out of these holes here so rather than going in and contaminating your brakes um, it will run out or I think that's the principle but all these holes here are feeling really horribly blocked so maybe that's one of the reasons that uh, we're having trouble with um, you know, oil leaking out because any lo any oil that did leak out, rather than escaping to the outside of the brake drum, it's actually it can't it can't get out the brake drum because these holes are blocked. So what's actually happening is uh, it's it's probably filling this up with oil and then that's running back into the inside of the brake drum, which is uh, yeah is, is is not good. So we'll take a little bit more care with this piece of tin work when we put it back together. We'll try and straighten it up a bit, and what I'll also try and do is I'll, I'll try and um, jam, unplug all these holes here, blow them all out, get some cleaner in there and blow them out, and hopefully if any oil does escape past the, uh, the seal, the new seal, going forward, hopefully it'll find its way onto the outside of the wheel rather than, um, you know, getting into the drum. Because it's small things and you small minds, and you don't get a mind much smaller than mine. So these are the countersunk screws that hold the brake drum on and uh, basically they, they screw into a, a couple of holes, there's just two of them. But again while it's off we'll just run a tap down and clear out any uh, rubbish that's in there. Well I cleaned up our hub in the paraffin washer and got most of the smegma off it and uh, I've also um, packed the outer bearing with grease. So what we've got to do now is we've just got to uh, reinstall this uh, inner bearing and put the oil seal in, so let's do that now. Mm -hmm. 